What's up, bros? <laughs> I just shot some hoops, and so now I'm going to talk about Space Jam. Why? <laughs> bros, let's talk about Space Jam. Space Jam, though. You know. <laughs> okay, bros. <laughs> In 1988, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was released to theaters after sitting in various stages of development for much of the preceding decade. Disney had earmarked the rights to the novel from which it was based in 81. Then, after a few years of creative experimentation, Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment was approached to partner with Disney and see the project to its conclusion. Both an incredibly costly production and one that involved an array of interactions between trademark characters of competing studios, the entire thing was kind of a bureaucratic nightmare. In the end, almost a dozen different companies had some level of involvement with the production of a film built entirely on unproven technology and a risky premise to begin with. Early screenings were oftentimes a flop, and it was starting to seem like Roger Rabbit would look more like a soulless corporate spectacle costing hundreds of animators years of their lives than an actual film. It was essentially going to be the food fight of its day. Then something kind of magical happened. It all just worked. What's up, Doc? Jumping without a parachute? Kinda dangerous, ain't it? Yeah. Yeah, huh? you could get killed, huh? Far from coming off like a group of executives shoving brands at a project the tech just wasn't ready for, Roger Rabbit was a technical marvel, and unlike certain other films, that didn't come at the cost of telling a genuinely fun and interesting story with lovable characters and some interesting ideas to take away. The branded cameos were fun without getting in the way of a coherent narrative, and on top of everything else, we got a surprisingly explicit message about the ways corporations exploit deep-held bigotries to justify profit making through ghettos and gentrification. As a seminal work of its kind, it was and remains a cinematic classic to this day. And then there was Space Jam, which blew it out of the goddamn water. Space Jam is a 1996 family comedy that is one part fictionalized biopic about the life of NBA superstar Michael Jordan, and one part sports drama about a commune of underground cartoon characters fighting off slavery at the hands of an invading alien empire. All of you are now our prisoners. <laughs> When the question of enslavement comes down to the winning side of a no-holds-barred basketball game, Michael Jordan is kidnapped and enlisted to help out the Toons, taking the jersey back up after a brief stint in baseball, and the rest of the film focuses mainly on their efforts to train up, take on this oppressive alien force, and finally win their freedom. It's a film that begins with a question, do you believe you can fly? And as Jordan grapples with his own struggles to believe in himself in a world he's become increasingly disillusioned by, his trials with the endlessly absurd Looney Tunes remind him that his his potential is, in the end, limited only by his own ambition and imagination. Or at least, that's what a scrub would say. I'm not here to tell you I think Space Jam is some kind of post-colonial polemic on the inherent delusion of the neoliberal promise that makes up the American dream. I'm here to tell you I know Space Jam is some kind of post-colonial polemic on the inherent delusion of the neoliberal promise that makes up the American dream. And here's why. Part 1, Space Jam. Now, I know what you're thinking. Jack, I'm willing to go with you on Disney's Sky High being fascist propaganda. I'm willing to accept that the Cars movies endorse eugenics. I'm even willing to accept that the MCU is about great man theory, and Jared Leto's Joker isn't actually that bad. But please, Jack, no. Not my precious Space Jam. Don't let your toxic need to overthink the political ideology of every piece of innocent media corrupt my sweet, beloved Space Jam. Well, I'm sorry, my patrons have already made that decision for me. And this video is going to be one hour long. So we've already briefly gone over what Space Jam is, what you probably remember it to be if you watched it obsessively as a kid like I did. But to really dig deeper into this film, we're gonna need to ask a very important question. What really is Space Jam? I also see Michael Jordan being sucked down a golf hole 
by furry creatures. That's it. Well, on one level, it was a cultural touchstone. It was the product of overworked animation and VFX teams at an unprecedented scale. A project that involved 18 different studios, record numbers of composite and FX shots for its time, innovations in virtual studio work, and a rolling production involving constant major reworks to the film because, oh yeah, did I mention the entire thing was done in 19 months? More than half of it in filming, meaning on top of everything else, it was made in half the time films like it usually need? The entire thing was a mess, and the film was fully expected to be one too. And yet, like Roger Rabbit before it, what we got was a critical and commercial darling. A film which made over a hundred million dollars, which was a lot of the time, and is to this day studied by critics and academics, hoping to figure out- okay, so in general the film was not well liked, and at this point everyone has basically decided it's only good as some cheap nostalgia. It did do well though, I wasn't lying about that. But no, I'm asking for real, what is Space Jam? And that is a surprisingly interesting question. See, often when I want to break down a piece of media to maybe expose an angle to it people might not have considered before, I'll try to work my way out from the core of it. This usually involves first looking at it as a purely self-contained narrative, after which I'll look at the surrounding context that informs the text, and then from there get a more complete picture of what the media really is. Think of it like a deeply disturbed child, dissecting forest creatures to learn animal anatomy. So the problem is, Space Jam is uniquely designed to be near impossible to do that with. Almost every element of the film trades on a knowledge of already established brands, to such an extent that the film is almost indecipherable without it. Like, have you ever tried imagining yourself watching Space Jam without knowing anything about it beforehand? You have this quiet, intimate opening with a young Michael Jordan bonding with his dad in the backyard one starry night, and then suddenly... Cut to Michael Jordan, now an adult, announcing his retirement from basketball, and then... Did you hear him? Did you hear him? It's a pretty surreal experience, and I think a lot of that is owed to the unique origins of this particular movie. See, Space Jam isn't strictly an original story, but it also isn't really a spin-off or adaptation of an already known one. The closest answer you can get to the question, what is Space Jam, is that it's a sequel to a shoe commercial. This is not hyperbole. The origin of Space Jam was a popular 1992 Super Bowl ad in which Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny joined forces to promote Nikes. Air Jordan and Air Jordan. What'd you expect? Yeah, my friend. It was the result of this ad's popularity that a movie was greenlit, and much of the crew, including director and very possibly me in 40 years Joe Pitka, were ultimately pulled from that project to work on this one. From the ground up, Space Jam existed as the product of a corporation looking to use the growing pop culture relevance of Michael Jordan to revitalize the waning pop culture relevance of the Looney Tunes, while also establishing a new merchandisable brand property on the side. Get a cool toy from Michael Jordan's new movie Space Jam. There's Bugs, Taz, and even some bad guys like Monstar. Bad guys like Monstar. And I mean, literally, merchandise was being produced before production had even finished. Brand spectacle came first, story second. Get your hands on, lace up your Nikes, grab your Wheaties and your Gatorade, we'll pick up a Big Mac on the way to the ballpark. And that leads to a film that is incredibly jumbled and confused to anyone who might be trying to approach this movie like one would approach... a movie. So that's right, Space Jam is the... of its day. <laughs> Space Jam was significantly influenced by Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and in fact during the earliest stages of development, producer Ivan Reitman would call Roger Rabbit director Robert Zemeckis for advice, who promptly gave him the advice that the project was a terrible idea and he should absolutely not do it. But while Space Jam, in my opinion, did a pretty good job iterating on the technical elements of Roger Rabbit, okay the crowd shots look quite bad, the narrative integration of man and toon was less successful. These feel like completely separate movies coldly stitched together, which is basically what they were. It's a funny contrast when the movie that inspired it was praised in large parts because of how it maintained a tone and aesthetic despite its wild premise. What holds it all together is the understanding that this is a movie about Michael Jordan meeting the Looney Tunes. But what is it without that? That's the question I was left with, and here is my answer. 
Space Jam is a movie about a man who drifts into a nostalgic fantasy in the midst of a midlife crisis, a period of his life wherein he's achieved all of the things he'd initially set out to do and discovered that in the end he still isn't really happy. We open with this incredibly heartfelt moment where this kid lists all of the things he wants to do someday. To get into college, to join the NBA, then move on to baseball just like his father did. And what would we expect to happen next in a sports movie? Well, surely we'd see him as an up-and-comer, an underdog, and we'd get to enjoy rooting for him and seeing his eventual rise to achieve those dreams he set out for. But that isn't how this movie ends, it's how it begins. Michael starts this movie with almost all of the things he set out to accomplish accomplished. The dramatic tension isn't that he hasn't made it yet, it's that he already has and he still isn't satisfied. Sure that nobody bothers Michael. I want him to be the happiest player in the world. The happiest. And so, desperate for answers, he slips into delusion, outside of physical space, far back into the recesses of his mind to the shows he was watching back when those dreams were just dreams. That this is the case makes a lot of sense when you consider the bizarre dream logic of the story up to and past this point. For the entire rest of the film up to his return home, Jordan seems to just forget he has a family who cares about him and who'd want to know what happened to him. There is a moment in the film where Jordan specifically says he needs to get his old shorts from home to play, and instead of going himself, he just lets Bugs and Daffy go on some wacky secret hijinks on his behalf. A spaceship very clearly blasts over a baseball field and crashes through a Piggly Wiggly and nobody seems to care that much. Characters somehow come and go from the Looney Tunes world, with almost no explanation at just the right moments. <laughs> Public officials take immediate action after a pandemic scare. That until we can guarantee the health and safety of our NBA players, there will be no more basketball this season. None of this makes any sense. And at this point, maybe you're thinking, that just sounds like bad writing. I don't see why there needs to be this grand meaning behind everything. I thought this video was going to be fun, but this guy seems really pretentious. And to that I say, wake the fuck up. To be clear, you could absolutely just end with this it was all a dream thing here and call it a day, and I would call that a pretty lazy and boring analysis. You could pretty much take any moment in any movie and say that after that point it was all a dream, and find at least a few pieces of evidence to support that case. Oh, do you notice how the movie gets a lot more romantic and sentimental once Jack stops Rose from jumping off the Titanic? It was just an old lady fantasy. Mad Max goes on a wildly successful rampage for revenge right after his wife dies. Dream sequence. Neo sleeping at the start of the Matrix. Good news for you, Jean Baudrillard. Nap time. Like, I really can't state more emphatically how much I hate this shallow kind of media analysis where we just take evidence to support how something was actually a dream or an alternate universe or the same universe as Undertale and then do absolutely nothing with it. The point in me making this assertion is that I genuinely think understanding Space Jam in this way makes it so much easier to grasp on both a narrative and thematic level. It's like finding out Tyler Durden was the main dude. It also winds up making this story of a main character being led by a rabbit into a dream world so they can learn more about themselves as a the pivotal point in their lives, kind of like a weird modern retelling of... Oh god. Oh god, no! Because at that point we ask, what would bring Michael to this specific fantasy? What would it tell us that these are the things he imagines, and this is the realization he comes to? It's another interesting element of Space Jam's narrative that the villains of Space Jam, the boss and lackeys of Moron Mountain, don't pose an actual threat to Jordan until very late in the story, and even in that case, it's something he specifically chooses. For about three quarters of this film, the only thing keeping Michael invested here is that some cartoon characters who just kidnapped him want his help. And he agrees for a simple reason. Because it's the Looney Tunes. Even if he doesn't know them the way you might know a friend, they are a part of his childhood, and in a way that makes them a part of his identity. Literally, something he identifies with. So what part of Michael do these tunes really represent to him? You guys are nuts. I think a lot of it comes down to a moment towards the end of the big game where backup player Stan is crushed by the Monstars and consequently inflated like a big balloon back to life. It's a great moment. Stop it. 
get some help. And in that moment, Michael says something. I do that. And you know, if I were a different channel, here I might say something like, Hey, what? Doesn't make much sense that Jordan would only question the physics of the Looney Tunes world at this stage in the movie, seeing as he's already been pulled by a lasso through a golf hole, thrown hundreds of feet through the air with minimal injuries, and at one point literally turned into a human ball. What a weird plot hole! And yeah, it's a valid point. The Toons really don't make any effort whatsoever to hide the way the Looney Tunes world works. As long as it can be imagined, it can be done. This is also the attitude Michael had instilled in him since he was a young boy. This endless belief in his own potential. And doubtless this drive had a considerable impact on his ultimate success in the NBA. But in hearing it re-explained by Bugs and Daffy, that's Michael's epiphany. It is his drive. and he is free to do with it what he wishes. He's not just in a world of possibilities, he is the arbiter of his own possibilities. Yes, he doesn't have to go back to basketball just because his old bosses and fans demand it, but he also doesn't need to stick with baseball out of some misguided feeling of childhood obligation. He realises that while his drive to achieve his goals is an admirable one, he should still allow himself to simply change his mind if something is not making him happy. The Looney Tunes are loose, undefined, unrestrained, undisciplined, and so they need Michael. But these attributes, which Jordan had discarded as childish things to be put away, wind up being exactly what he needs to realise he has changed, and his dreams can change too. The Looney Tunes teach Michael Jordan to practice self-care. It might seem like the B-plot to much of Space Jam, of some of Michael's fellow NBA players living life robbed of their talents, throws a wrench into the whole Michael's dream thing. It wasn't a dream, it really happened. But I would argue it's actually a hugely important aspect of it. As a subplot, it's almost totally superfluous to the film's plot. It could have arguably raised the stakes for how terrible life would be for Michael if he lost the game, if giving away his talent was on the table, but instead the raise the stakes moment is just straight up trading away his freedom, so there's really nothing here. Pleb take. This subplot's here so more big name NBA stars get to be in the movie. Patrician take. This aspect of Michael's fantasy outlines his deepest and darkest anxiety. That for all Michael drives himself with dreams and ambition, without his talent, he is nothing. Not Charles Barkley. It's a wannabe who looks like him. Shouldn't even be here. Now, we're going to put a pin in that particular element of the plot for now, because I think as it stands, I can safely say you've achieved a basic level understanding of Space Jam. Congratulations! It's an existential journey for a man who seemingly achieved everything, realising his ultimate fulfilment can only come from within. So to give us more to work with going forward, this is the part of the video where I abruptly transition to a way more serious topic. It was always going to happen, but I feel like we should rip the band-aid off now. Okay. Here we go. And... <laughs> In 2016, a children's book was released in dedication to then-presidential candidate Hillary Clinton that raised more than a few eyebrows. It was called Some Girls Are Born To Lead, with most of the book detailing how Hillary overcame overwhelming institutional sexism to achieve her dreams of leading. One page specifically got people's attention, one which stated plainly, In the 1950s, it was a man's world. Only boys could grow up to have powerful jobs. Only boys had no ceilings on their dreams. Girls weren't supposed to act smart, tough, or ambitious, even though deep inside they may have felt that way. But in the town of Park Ridge, Illinois, along came Hillary. So ignoring, like, a third of that statement, there's definitely something approaching a reasonable point here, right? Like, yes, clearly the 1950s and its surrounding decades were rife with institutional barriers for women that simply did not exist for men. And yeah, the idea that men had no ceilings on their dreams relative to women does completely ignore any class-based aspect of this conversation, but like, shock horror the Hillary Children's book was written by liberals. <gasps> so one problem, when displaying an image of all of the successful men who had no ceilings on their dreams, um, they decided to put in Jackie Robinson. So. I'm not going to say that Jackie Robinson was definitely the worst example they could have picked for a man with no ceilings on his dreams. 
you know, like, because racial segregation policies were still very much in effect in the US in the 1950s, which led to significant problems for Robinson all throughout his childhood and career, repeated threats to his life, just every possible way a ceiling could be put on someone's dreams, uh, you would think that they would definitely be the worst example you could pick. But then on the other side of the page, they put Nat King Cole, so... Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are the unalienable rights as outlined by OG No Steppy Snack Man and genuine scumbag Thomas Jefferson. And while the Declaration of Independence is a specifically American piece of legislation, I think the ideas that emerge from it represent a lot more than just US politics. In a word, a narrative. It suggests something pretty significant. The parameters through which we can determine a just and unjust world. In a just world, people might not necessarily be satisfied with their lives, but no matter where they start life, they have the opportunity to pursue that if they're willing to work hard enough. In its ideal form, a rags to riches story. And an unjust world, as stories like Some Girls Are Born to Lead outline for us, is one where roadblocks and restrictions are put on those who want to follow their ambitions. In other in other words, restricting them from one of their most fundamental rights. By putting athletes and entertainers who famously had to fight through massive systemic injustice to achieve anything close to the dreams they set out for, Some Girls Are Born to Lead starts to expose something fairly obvious. That this whole narrative, while doing its job of giving us the good feels, is pretty flimsy and kind of bullshit. Life is material. It's at least clear what we're talking about when it's called an unalienable right, even if it's kind of weird for that to be the case in a nation that still has the death penalty. Liberty, less clear. Especially when the existence of documents like this, in which a government is deciding what rights you get to enjoy, already tells us it's a little more complicated. Pursuit of happiness, though, that takes the cake, and might be one of the most subtly sinister phrases I've ever seen printed on Walmart merchandise. You have the right to try to be happy. We have no obligation to help you achieve a happier life. We're in fact gonna leave the wording just vague enough that you have very few material protections. But, you know, have fun. So we have questions. Like, did Nat King Cole have the right to pursue his own happiness? He certainly made a significant mark on the musical world, if that's what he was going for. On the other hand, I'd argue the constant discrimination in where he could perform, who with and who to, the difficulties he had working in large chunks of the US, and the racist attacks that put him in real mortal danger, kind of violate the principle. The problem is that, in actuality, these are the kinds of questions rhetoric like this wants us to ask. Are there places where people's right to pursue happiness is being encroached. What can we do to alleviate that? And again, in these kinds of stories, these are concerns that do get acknowledged, of artificial barriers getting in the way of what people deserve. What doesn't get addressed is that the entire premise of the pursuit of happiness isn't there to aid in achieving some pure, distilled form of individual liberty. In fact, it's quite the opposite. A phrase written vaguely enough that it can still apply even in regions suffering from massive, overwhelming oppression and injustice. Even if relative wealth and privilege could make the pursuit of happiness easier, these things are not one-to-one -one equivalents, and so they sit just outside the jurisdiction. Preserving your right to pursue happiness doesn't equate to any real material material protections. It's just acknowledging a feeling that can't be controlled in the first place. There's a lot of historical dispute about the existence of a differently worded declaration based on the writings of John Locke, life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. And while it's not as nice sounding as what we've got, I at least appreciate its honesty. Happiness isn't something that can be reliably measured in the same way a physical resource like land can. But by transferring everything onto the idea of pursuing what amounts to a feeling, all responsibility to deal with the various hurdles that make up systemic injustice and inequality now fall to you. After all, no group or government can make you happy. It isn't something that can be given. Whether you're rich, poor, black, white, cis, or trans, happiness is something only you can define and achieve. And by extension, any struggle you have to overcome to get there is yours and yours alone. Personal responsibility, even for things we cannot control. The pursuit of happiness is not a rallying cry for social progress. It's the justifying ideology of status quo. Now at this point you might be asking, what does this have to do with Space Jam? <laughs> and to that I say, 
everything. Literally everything. I have just summarized the entire moral and philosophical conflict of Space Jam, and now we're going to spend an entire section of this video breaking down what that means. I'd like to return for a moment to the villains of Space Jam, focusing mainly on their relationship to Michael. So did you know the weird gremlins who lived on Moran Mountain are called Nerdlux? Did you know that their boss is called Swackhammer? Did you know that each individual Nerdluck has their own name? They are Bupkiss, Nort, Bang, Blanco, and Pound. Is what an absolute Space Jam newbie would say, as despite every other summary and wiki page giving them those names, the behind the jam section of the still running SpaceJam.com website clearly names them as Bupkiss, Nada, Null, Void, and Zilch. Get good. <laughs> Honestly, it isn't too hard to forget Goblin Danny DeVito and his cadre of goblin children. They kind of sit in a weird place in the film, inexplicably being one of the only truly original core elements to it, having never appeared before or since the release of Space Jam, outside of a cameo in a Pinky and the Brain episode. But also, they're just not super memorable as characters. Swackhammer himself disappears for large chunks of the plot, and the remaining nerd lugs are kind of just walking punchlines who help hold the plot together by being too stupid to make basic observations about things. At the same time, they are the plot movers. They are the only reason for the events of the narrative, and their roles and motivations still play a great part in Michael's own emotional journey in the film. So what are their motivations? Well, uh... It's capitalism. We need new attractions. Right? Capitalism is the main motivation. The customer is always right. They want to make more money by enslaving a less technologically advanced race. Always. And that's before I overthink it. So of all the things to choose to center this particular plot around, slavery is a really interesting one. It's both a fairly universally familiar frowned upon thing, but also feels weirdly real and specific for a light-hearted cartoon comedy. And that's without considering the part of the movie that literally shows a vision of Michael Jordan chained up and forced to do manual labor. Watching it, you'd almost get the impression profit-motivated enslavement at the hands of a hostile colonizing force is just this totally abstract notion, and not something that's still happening to like 40 million people across the globe, and was still codified in law just over a century ago in the very nation the film is set. I think it's easy for a lot of people... Okay, I think it's easy for a lot of white people to forget that talking about slavery isn't the same as talking about, like, ancient Egypt or Henry VIII's wives. It is a very recent and raw thing, and if you're someone Michael Jordan's age, you're talking about maybe a four-generation gap between him and family members who had to deal with the very immediate consequences of an emancipated America. Subsequent decades of unresolved trauma, inequality, and exploitation still felt to this day. There's also the fact that we're only talking about one specific legal mandate. There's at least another 400,000 slaves living in the US, and that's not even including prison labor which is slave labor. Also an extremely high likelihood at least some of the movie's merchandise benefited from overseas child labor. And look, I'm not here to cancel Space Jam for not treating a subject matter with the seriousness I think it should. I am literally the last possible person who could make that criticism. Was eugenics propaganda? I find the creative choice to make this the specific conflict of the film interesting. Not like morally indecent. Now, the simple answer to why Space Jam treats slavery like it does is because it's specifically targeted to an audience that would find such a concept on about the same level of patent absurdity as Michael Jordan playing basketball with the Looney Tunes. Being the simple answer, it's also the most boring one. So I'm gonna say it's representative of Michael's deep guilt about the nature of the society he succeeded in. And to get what I mean, we're gonna return to that American Dream stuff we were talking about earlier. And by American dream, I mean Michael Jordan, who is literally the American dream. Born into a financially struggling family in an unstable climate, forced to move back and forth for his family's work, and, you know, living in a deeply racist country, Michael Jordan grew up with his fair share of struggles. And what did he do with that? Well, he picked a passion, trained hard, played every game like it was his last, and in the end became one of the most famous and beloved people in the world. Hey, Does it doesn't matter where you are, man. Are you one of this in the building? Next to God. Next to God. 
I just got one from it. <laughs> I mean, that is just the pursuit of happiness in motion, right? We can dispute if he was quite the best player of all time. I'm pretty sure he is, but I don't want to make the LeBron fans mad in the comments. But this man was able to pretty much go from nothing to everything. And it was all thanks to that perfect combination of sheer determination and a land of opportunity. If you wanted to quickly dismiss someone who was trying to say racism and wealth inequality impede personal opportunity and success, you would give them Michael Jordan. He is the ultimate example of how a society governed by merit can uplift those at the bottom. Now, in the Looney Tunes world, all of these concerns are totally foreign. In this world, there is no death, no illness, no struggle for necessities or starvation. The constraints of their world are pure fantasy, and as you'd assume based on that, the shape of their society is incomprehensible when compared to our own. There's some basic idea of an organized community, but really they don't get much done and seem to just dedicate their time instead to recreationally antagonizing each other for seemingly little gain. It's basically Twitter. You could call it a utopia or a purgatory. Either way, it's a world incomparable to our own, mostly due to the fact that its citizens are not constrained by material conditions. To them, a bullet wound is a brief gag, and finding out you're being screwed out of royalties on a multi-million dollar property is an afterthought. You know all those mugs and uh, t-shirts and lunch boxes with our pictures on them? Yeah? You uh, ever see any money from all that stuff? <laughs> Not a cent. All of this makes the characterization of the Nerdlucks, and particularly Swackhammer, fascinating to me. See, they, despite the whole gremlin men living on the moon thing, seem to live in a world much like our own. Swackhammer has a business. That business employs the Nerdlucks. That business also needs customers to stay running, and customers are a limited resource, so they need to get competitive. All else stripped away, their lives are likely much closer to that of the average person than the lives of the Looney Tunes. They fall into a highly materialistic worldview because that's the necessary reality of their civilization. The Toon strength is in what they can imagine. The Nerdluck strength is in what they can take. I got it. I got his talent. Oh, wow. And so, as with any good rags to riches story, the Nerdlucks are a group that is financially struggling, in need of some competitive edge to help their intergalactic theme park succeed. Some real daddy daycare, we bought a zoo energy here. But in doing that, in coming up with a plan and pursuing their success, taking advantage of what opportunities they need to prosper, they become users, oppressors, wannabe slave drivers. Because the Nerdlucks are, just like us, residents of the hell world of late stage capitalism. A world in which exploitation is rampant in the name of competition, and success is measured by the greatest profit at the lowest cost, exactly as advertised. As we've already gone over, the pursuit of happiness narrative brings with it a few inescapable complications. Most notably that the virtues it represents of liberty and individual choice doesn't really reflect the reality of what it spells out. Indifference to the corrupt and unjust systems that make liberty and individual choice so much harder. Whether you're a retired multi-millionaire or an impoverished single parent, you have the ability to pursue happiness. The fact that material conditions make life much harder for one of you than the other is irrelevant. Once again, the rhetoric of personal responsibility. And that feels so contradictory, right? It's a set of well-established principles for a liberated society, which conveniently ignores the things that have strong material influence over that liberty. So the Looney Tunes represent an extreme of idealism, whereby literally everything is subject to the whims of self-belief. And the Nerdlucks represent an extreme of materialism, seeing everything as a theoretical commodity to be manipulated and profited from. Through them we rattle off the worst that this worldview has to offer. The destruction of other people's lives, exploitation and slavery. And Michael? Well, Michael learns the way of the Looney Tunes, grows an arm as long as the court, hits a sick as fuck dunk, and then gets to go home as I Believe I Can Fly plays softly in the background. And this conclusion, for all that inspires joy and relief, might be one of the most depressing things I've seen in all of cinema. Because in this sequence of moments, Michael concludes the only way to resolve the contradictions I've just described is literal magical thinking. 
See, when I say Michael Jordan is the ultimate representation of the American dream, I'm not just saying that as this nice congratulatory thing. I mean, obviously the fact that he managed to go from working class struggle to international icon and star of Space Jam, that is deeply inspiring. And it's especially inspiring because it tells people that they too can rise above oppression and marginalization if they're willing to fight hard enough. That is the message this movie is seemingly offering. A familiar phrase for any classroom in the last 40 years, if you believe in yourself, you can do anything. But from the perspective of someone who grew up being told that and then lived through free global recessions, here's the problem. That statement is and has always been a lie. And that's not in spite of this philosophy of imagination and self-determination, it's in part because of it. Michael Jordan is highly competitive. It was arguably his most infamous trait on and off the court. The ways he would rile himself up to go after another team or another player and just ruthlessly destroy them. There's nothing he would not do to get himself to the place where he's going to beat you. Although as he's repeatedly made clear it never became a major problem, he made bets and gambled regularly. Jordan made everything a competition, and as a sportsman, that was a major benefit to his career. He always worked his hardest because he always felt like he had something to prove that night. But something I think is interesting to talk about is what we mean when we say competition. So for instance, look at the Looney Tunes in the context of Space Jam. They are competitive with each other, but in lieu of any meaningful consequence to their actions, it doesn't really amount to more than a big game. Now look at the Nerdlucks. Their world is a world of competitions with real, lasting repercussions. A battle for resources which will dictate who gets to succeed and who will be a permanent failure. In late stage capitalism, major commercial sports sit in an interesting place within this dichotomy. Nobody's gonna die because of the results of an NBA game, unless they made a really stupid bet. In real terms, all that happens is the game is called, the players rest, and the court is cleaned up ready for the next. These men are doing battle in a sense, but the meaningful consequences of wins and losses are all in their mind. Except also, they absolutely are not. Millions of dollars are often on the table depending on a player's stats. Entire careers can be irreparably harmed or even destroyed by a few bad games. The difference between a good player and a great one can often be determined by the slightest wavering in performance, and all the while the lives of those players and their families are left hanging in the balance. And the more Michael Jordans there are, the better you have to play to stay ahead of the pack. Except, as we all know, not everyone can be a Michael Jordan. A familiar motif throughout Space Jam is characters who clearly are not and can never be in Michael Jordan's position shooting their shot regardless. The Toons want to be Jordan, Stan wants to be Jordan, even Bill Murray, a success in his own right, wants to be Jordan. It's because I'm white, isn't it? And while that is an incredibly funny joke, definitely something the movie needed six times, it points to a reality in our world that just because you believe it doesn't mean you can do it. Age, disability, mental illness. On a purely physical level, any number of things limit a person's options in pursuing certain goals. That's not even factoring in race and gender discrimination we've already gone over, and that's not even factoring in that once again, we live in a world where most people are left with very few resources. And if you don't have the time or the money needed to buy that time, yet again your options are limited. These are not value judgments. No person is inherently lesser as a result of any of this. But through this lens of that American dream worldview, they might as well be, right? Because it's irrelevant who you are or where you came from, what matters is if you're a winner or a loser. The winners profit the losers pay. Space Jam at first seems to be giving us a naive and idyllic view of the world, the kind perfect to be packaged up and shipped out to millions of unaware children. Don't worry kids, as long as you believe in yourself, everything will work out fine. But hidden underneath, Starship Trooper style, is a film that's incredibly cynical about the realities of the society we live in. In the view of Space Jam, the world is a place of disappointment and disillusionment, even for its most successful. Capitalism is colonialist exploitation with a fresh coat of paint, and the only solace we can find is in a fantasy so disconnected from our real lives that all it can offer us is pithy platitudes about believing in yourself. 
One cannot conceive of a just world under capitalism without first imagining they live in a children's cartoon. And that's not even to mention Space Jam's most pointed and damning lie. You know, so late in the video, you've probably noticed that Lola Bunny hasn't really come up at all in this one. Well, that's mostly because I got to the end of the writing process and then realized she wasn't that interesting a character and I didn't have much to say. Better luck next time, hangers on from the Beastars videos. Oh wait, hang on. I have a special guest here to take this one. Why would anyone want to fuck a rabbit? What sense does that make? Rabbits aren't sexy, rabbits are food! Let me make one thing perfectly clear to all you Warner Brothers representatives out there. We don't want to fuck bunnies! Capitalist realism is a concept I've brought up a few times on this channel. Conceived by the late Mark Fisher in his book of the same name, what Fisher describes is a society in which a singular social and economic system, in this case capitalism, has become so deeply embedded within every aspect of how we think and see the world that an alternative can no longer be pictured. As with the American Dream, it's a permanent argument for the status quo not because that status quo is seen as fair or just, but because it's all we can imagine. This is why, generally speaking, liberal critiques of society serve more as controlled opposition to the status quo than any meaningful resistance to it. They can only criticize the exploitation empowered by capitalism from a capitalist mindset. It's also why, in recognizing these problems and their inability to fully address them, there's a tendency for liberal media to take real-life events and infuse them with a greater sense of justice and progress than was there to begin with. Frost Nixon is an example of this. The Trial of the Chicago 7 is an example of this. Hamilton is an example of this. And I think, in this way, Space Jam serves as the ultimate lib parody. So within Michael's fantasy narrative between the Nerd Lux and the Looney Tunes, the Goblin Men initially come for a full-on hostile takeover. No agreements, no treaties, just round up the Looney Tunes and bring them to Moron Mountain so they can serve as their big new attraction and pull in some customers. They have the superior firepower and the Tunes are in no place to make demands. Then something happens. Bugs pulls out what he declares the guidebook to capturing cartoon characters and quickly scrolls down rule number one. Give them a chance to defend themselves. Uh, do we have to? It's in the rule book. It is. Okay. It is in the rule book. And then from there they come up with the idea of a basketball game, etc, etc. This is, in my opinion, the best joke in the entire film. The entire plot moving forward relies on the premise that the antagonists take the obviously meaningless set of rules and actually follow them for absolutely no reason. They, and even the extremely shifty and conniving Swackhammer, just do it, because they're told the book says they should. This is what I like to call the Nerdluck Principle. The Nerdlucks arrive to us as a representation of all the worst elements of our current society. The dehumanizing, strong-arming, exploitative nature of the systems we live under. And these are all things we are aware exist in the world right now. We know first world nations profit from third world labor. We know powerful governments will occupy nations and force regime changes to preserve their own influence. We know the rich dodge consequences. The way our system is designed benefits those willing to use every underhanded trick to expand and maintain their power, and under capitalism, that will always include competitive exploitation. Greatest profit, least expense. Yet with all of this, we will hear a call to respect the process and remain civil. Despite knowing full well that the groups who hold power have no reason nor incentive to play by these rules, it's suddenly decided that what's most important is simply pretending that they do. Not because there's any reason to trust these forces, but because we can imagine no alternative. Things are gonna be okay. In Michael's delusion, we see that play out pretty bluntly. And lo and behold, it seems impossibly contrived and convenient even for a cartoon movie made for small children. It's in the rule book. It is. Space Jam gives us a fantasy. A fantasy which simultaneously confronts the darker natures of our world in a surprisingly explicit way, while also reconstructing that world in a way that's softer, more comprehensible, and easier to solve. It's a war between a group representing total liberty, 
total irreverence towards any level of authority, and a society much like our own, full of mutual oppressions as groups forced to make do with limited resources compete for what they can. And in the worldview it provides us, we see that there is only one way to reckon with the ways these systems alienate, commodify, and use us. To hope that with the power of sheer self-belief, all of this can be overcome. Revolution reimagined as a form of personal therapy. The crushing truth for Michael at the end of the film is that, for as uplifted as he is by his time with the Looney Tunes, the entire thing was an emotional placebo. This outer body trip seems to have led to some great epiphany about the nature of his world and the power of his own determination. But Michael didn't win that game because he realised something about himself. He won because he realised something about the world he was in at that moment. And outside of that, there is nothing left. No matter how much he believes in himself, Michael cannot escape that the conditions which surround him play a fundamental and inescapable role in his life. In the way the Toon Squad needed the power of imagination, he needed training, he needed support, to be young and able-bodied and clear of mind. Without that, without his talent, he would be nothing, just like the millions of others on whose backs the world he's in thrives. As I reach the end of this video, I'm becoming more aware of the fact that there's been a pretty negative spin on a lot of my interpretation of Space Jam today. I've basically painted the entire movie as like satire of liberal delusion around the American dream and its related systems. Do I really feel that way? Hell yeah! I mean, as anyone who's been on my channel long enough knows, I am perfectly fine underlining that this is only one way of interpreting the film, and I'm sure there's some better ones out there. But I do think it's a film that's deeply suspicious of the narratives we're told regarding success. It's genuinely ballsy, in my opinion, to open with the epitome of the universally beloved brand-approved real-world superstar, and then just have them generally unsatisfied with where they are in life. Not to armchair diagnose Michael Jordan because of his role in a kids movie, but this is another crucial aspect of this hyper-competitive culture that I think can get missed. That even those who seemingly sit at the top of the totem pole often still haven't found contentment. It's certainly nice to imagine that somewhere just under the surface, a world like the Looney Tunes is real. A world where the material is such a non-consideration that life itself can bend to the whims of dream logic. Meanwhile, in our own world, power exists in the material, who holds wealth and influence and what they want to do with it. This doesn't mean that in some sense dreams and ideas don't play a role in our lives. An epiphany like we see from Michael in this film can still be a step towards some material change, but not in these terms. Some may look at the obvious absurdities of Space Jam and mistake that for a text itself that's frivolous and not worth anyone's time. In my view, that absurdity guides the message. A message that, to come to terms with a world we're unhappy with without external change, we're forced to concoct the most ridiculous internal narratives to delude ourselves. Narratives can guide and shape the ways we see the world. They can make us think in our unhappiness we must always be doing something wrong, and trick us into thinking we're powerless when we're not. Why are you take it from this guy? Because he's bigger. He's bigger than we used. To be. It can deeply and irreparably skew our perspectives of what normal is. But sometimes, realising is all it takes. Realising not just some deep inner truth about the power of our imaginations, but what the material conditions of our world are, who controls it, and how it can be changed. A person can always pursue happiness, and sometimes they might find it. But in the real world, the bad guys aren't getting tricked by a piece of paper telling them to play fair. And so, with all that said, all that's left is a question. You all ready for this? Hey! 
Did you know this video was sponsored by Skillshare? What is Skillshare? Skillshare is an online learning tool offering an array of classes in a variety of fields. Everything from art to editing, design and more. Even in the midst of a pandemic, Skillshare is hosting more and more classes for you to take a look at. Classes I've been looking at like Charlie Clements on digital portraiture or Ali Abdal's class on productivity which I really should have watched before I started making this video. And good news! Skillshare is giving us a generous special offer if you check out the link down below. The first thousand people who click the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership, and after that an annual subscription comes in at less than 10 bucks a month. So give it a shot and let your imagination run wild. Remember, your opportunities may be hindered by material conditions, but a little education can't hurt. Hey everybody, thank you all for watching. Uh, I'm actually recording this after staying up all night, uh, finishing this script. So, hope you enjoy the video. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I feel like this is a good opportunity to thank my patrons, who are actually the reason that this video even exists. Uh, I had set a 500 patron thing to do an hour-long Space Jam video, assuming that we wouldn't get there until like 2022, if that. Uh, and we're there, so the video's out. It's something. I'd like to give a thank you to all my patrons uh, who are scrolling by right now. Might, maybe, uh, this will be a slower credits than usual, so you'll really get to savor your name there. Also, thank you to the people on our coffee or Kofi, the the people who have just done the one-time donations. I know I understand a lot of people with all this going on right now don't want to do like full monthly payment things so you know people who just send one-time payments that's cool too thank you very much I think my thousand patron thing is like a video about kangaroo jack so I might change that or make it like an audience decides thing because I, I don't want to make an hour-long video about kangaroo jack as far as what I'll be doing after this video um, I think I'm like a little bit fried from all these like big long projects I've been doing So I'm probably gonna slow down a little bit my content for the last couple months uh, Take some take some time off, you know, so just be ready for that. I guess you guys are cool. You'll be okay with it I'm just I'm just saying um, But I will be doing twitch streams. I'm gonna be trying to do more of those so you know just hanging out talking about stuff playing some video games. I still need to finish Death Stranding. Um, so if you just want to hang out, see how I'm getting on, see how my projects are going, there's a link in the description for my Twitch stream and hope you check it out. So one thing I wanted to do, we've got the credits here right now, there were a few things I wanted to point out in the video but there was never like a convenient time to. So I'm just gonna like, I've got them written down here, I just want to bring them up real quick. So first of all, Dover Boys cameo. Did you guys know there was a Dover Boys cameo in Space Jam? I didn't. It's pretty pretty cool. If you don't know, uh, Dover Boys is kind of like a cult classic, one of those Looney Tunes shorts. Um, but I really like seeing them get a little cameo. They don't usually get acknowledged. Um, it made me imagine an alternate reality where the Dover Boys was really popular instead of Bugs Bunny. So maybe we could have had a Space Jam where it was about you know the Dover Boys and Michael Jordan's helping the Dover Boys win a game of hide and seek. What could have been? Also, I did mention this in the video, but a big hats off to everyone involved with the Space Jam website. I, I, I just want to really underline how proud I am of all of you for keeping that website up and running in its, in its precious state <laughs> that it's currently in. Uh, it was an excellent resource. I got a lot out of it, so, so thank you very much for that. And the last thing I had written down here was just a, uh, just a question. Um, why are Granny Thick? Hello! If you're hearing this, it's because uh, I got to the part where I was editing and I realized the video wasn't long enough and I needed to put extra long credits in. Um, but also it was like the credits were too long, so I felt like I needed to put like maybe some content in the credits because otherwise I'd feel like I was kind of cheating myself out of the hour long video thing. Um, so what you're getting for the next few minutes will be me uh, reading a few pages uh, from the webcomic Tales Gets Trolled. I'll be voicing all of the characters. Um, it's a good webcomic, so so, so, uh, so let's, let's start. This is Mario, he's laying on the ground, and he says, All right, Luigi, you win! And then Luigi, also bloodied, so I'm assuming they had some kind of fight here. Mario, 
You've gotten in my way long enough. Now it's my time. And then it looks, we look angrily at Luigi and he goes, Now die! And then Shadow the Hedgehog runs on screen and goes, Stop! And then Shadow pulls out a fucking gun and says, I'm not gonna lose a good member just because of some gay rap and his gay fucking duck friend. <laughs> I don't know the context of this part of the comic, but then he shoots Daffy Duck in the fucking head. Oh my god, Daffy Duck f falls over dead. Uh, Bugs Bunny looks with concern. Elmer Fudd and Luigi. Next page, we have a crying Bugs Bunny on his knees. No, Daff. Daffy. And then Elmer Fudd looks stupidly at the camera and says, I didn't know it was duck season. And then Bugs goes, No, you killed my love, Daffy. I actually um, ship that, funnily enough, from uh, Looney Tunes Back in Action. They had, they had strong chemistry. Uh, Shadow points his gun and says, Get the fuck away from Mario. If you guys try anything, I'll kill all of us. And then some lady who I'm, I'm not familiar with, I believe this is part of the Tales Gets Trolled lore, but anyway, she says, Do as he says. He's not fucking around. He will not hesitate to kill all of us. And then Shadow goes, Mario, get over here. And then Shadow says, Now me and my team are gonna leave you at leave and you're gonna die. And he's got like a detonator. And then Mario goes, All right, Shadow. And then Bugs goes, No! And then Shadow goes, No, don't break the remote! Because Bugs jumps for the remote and then breaks the remote. And then Mar Bugs Bunny goes, Ah! And then Shadow goes, You fucked up all of my plans! And then he shoots Bugs Bunny in the head and then shoots him and then until he's just like mush, a red mush. And then Shadow goes, Die! And then Mario goes, Shadow, stop! He's already dead! <laughs> and there's like nothing left of Bugs' head. His brain is just... Oh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I'm assuming the credits are done at this point. If they're still going, I, I really messed up. Uh, but yeah, hope you enjoyed that.
congratulations, you made it to the end of the credits. Here is your reward, an excerpt from the secret Bugs Bunny rap song, Buggin', included on the Space Jam soundtrack, but not actually featured in the film. Enjoy. <laughs> Up to my ears in carrots. Like Trump's wife, up to my ears in carrots. Jay Z co wrote that, by the way. Wait, there's an election happening? 